So, Bud, um, you're from La Fours? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you born and raised there? Or? No, no, no. I'm a West Coast boy. West Coast boy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where were you born and raised? The uh, state of Washington is where I was born. City of Aberdeen. Okay. Goose Bay. Goose Bay. I don't know how to pronounce it. I haven't been there in a long time. Yeah, yeah. And I was raised in Oregon. Okay. So, graduated from Oregon High School or? Yeah, Bear Union High. Okay. And Class of 67. 67. So, you were just about right for this, weren't you? Or wrong Well, well my graduation present was here. Yeah. Here's your free ticket. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, were you drafted or did you join? Well, I was, uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny, because uh, my dad uh, had some members of the draft board were friends of his, and they told him, he said, they said, his number's coming up pretty quick. So I went down and talked to some gentlemen, and I went into, was going to go into helicopter flight school, and uh, that's what I signed up for. And then when I got to there, the school was closed. Oh. So I became an Airborne Ranger. Oh, wow. 75th Rangers. So you, you jumped, did you jump from? Airplanes. Uh, airplanes then? Yes. <laughs> what did you think the, fir um, the first time you were gonna go do that? Uh, I was pretty scared. Yeah? I wasn't as bad as some guys. I, you know, I'm one of those people that doesn't know why it's right to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Well, I, I tell you, it's, uh, I understand why they develop that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, nowadays with a new paracommanded parachute, uh, it's like dropping off with the wind just right over Amarillo and landing here in Pampa. Yeah. That's quite a distance you can go with those things. Right. Because right. you can catch up lifts and drafts. And you can go just like a bird, just circle, circle, and come back down. So where did you go to learn this? Uh, Fort Benning, skin? Georgia. Okay. And Delonica, Georgia. And, and so um, how, how different was it jumping out of planes in Georgia, learning that, and jumping out of uh, planes when you got to Vietnam. Oh, we didn't jump in Vietnam. Okay. See, what they sent they, they they sent us uh, 134 of us over in a group, and as soon as they got there, they split us up. Uh, I've got a neighbor down there in La Forest, and uh, he has also a 101st hat with Ranger on the back of it. I haven't been able to find one yet. Mm. And uh, I was talking to him, and uh, he went to the first 506, and I went to the first 501st. And uh, we were maybe five miles from the DMZ mm. up there, and we did a lot of work in the mountains and uh, big, thick jungle yeah. areas. So, in the DMZ, were you close to any particular city or base? Well, our, our uh, flight base was uh, Fubai Airport. Okay. And uh, we did a lot of stuff around the city away. Okay, okay. And so I, I was there in 1968, 1969. What was your principal assignment? Uh, seek and destroy. Okay. What did you use to seek and destroy? Uh, me. <laughs> 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 I was one of the ones that went out there in the jungles and face to face. Mm -hmm. It wasn't pretty. No. no. People don't know what that combat was like. Oh, well, uh, I averaged maybe three hours sleep a night the whole time I was there. Well, yeah. the adrenaline will really will keep you awake, mm -hmm. especially if you don't know where it's coming from or when it's coming from. Any time of day, day or night, 
Doesn't make any difference. What was a typical day like? Uh, moving through the jungle, just sweating your rear end off, you know, and cutting trails. And then every once in a while you run into something that is quite unpleasant. And uh, Is that enemy troops? Is that people who, well, who you can't tell are enemies? What is it? Well, where, where I was at, if it, in the jungle part of it, we had orders that anything that was not in a village was to be considered an enemy. And of course, we didn't just open fire on anybody. We had to make sure that they were a true enemy. But then when we got out of the jungles and down into some of the valleys where the rice paddies were, that's when it became very unpleasant because you're out in the open. In the jungles, uh, you're lucky if I could see from maybe from here to just beyond the cameras there. It's just that thick. Yeah. And uh, so if you run into something there, if it's like that close, right. you can't, uh, can't escape it. But out in the open in the rice paddies. Oh yeah, they can get you distances there. Yeah, snipers kind of situation. Yeah, I've had snipers shoot at us. Um, I've had uh, some mortar rounds shot at us, and gotten some shrap metal here, there, and yonder, you know, from it. So hmm. there's times it was uh, rather pleasant too. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, we had this one area that the village was close to the fire base. When I say close, when maybe a couple of miles, uh, we'd go out and, and the city or the village chieftain would invite us to dinner. Hmm. Of course, you never asked what you were eating. Yeah. You just sat and ate with them. And uh, their customs are quite different than ours. But what I learned the most is that country has had 800 years of fighting. And in their language, there is no word for freedom. Hmm. No, they didn't know what it was. Hmm. And it's sad because they've been in subjection for 800 years, either one form or another. And somewhere along the line, the word freedom in their language just doesn't exist anymore. See, they're communists now, still under subjection. Of course, they just bow to it and there's no more fighting, but it's, uh, Still not free, yeah. not like we know it anyway. So what were those dinners like? Oh, oh, when I see it, you'd get a big banana tree leaf, and you'd have rice and the meat, and then you'd have a little sauce. I learned that the rice and the meat's okay. Don't touch the sauce. Why? Uh, because it's hotter than any jalapeno sauce you ever see, <laughs> or ever put your tongue to. <laughs> Because it will burn you, <laughs> boy. <laughs> would, would there be lots of people in, in this well, house? Well, usually, usually you have a um, maybe a circle of about eight or nine people. Of course, the chieftain and his wife, and then uh, our higher uh, either NCOs or, or uh, officers would sit close to them, and then we would be around. Okay. And uh, usually they had one child that could speak both languages, and it'd be the interpreter. Huh. They'd uh, stand back. Sometimes we used to take our own interpreters if the chieftain allowed it. It's always what he allows. Uh, the very honorable people, they have set ways. And uh, they're tough. 
as small as they were, they were just tough people. So you got to know some of them or felt like you knew? Uh, well, we never got on a personal basis. Right. Uh, you didn't ever really want to. But it was uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was. But uh, they knew why we were there. Uh, a lot of people didn't think we were doing any good there. But uh, I seen them send their children to higher educations, like the city of Way had two universities. And one of them was in the French Fort and one of them was outside the French Fort. And uh, it was uh, pretty, pretty decent while we were there as far as they're able to expand their horizons, if you want to call it that, other than just being rice farmers and stuff. So you saw them wanting better for, oh, yeah. for their families? Oh, definitely. But see, uh, now I don't want to say anything against our government, but they had a treaty with uh, the Saigon government. President Key and the Saigon government. Saigon was just one town. And those poor farmers and ranchers out there, uh, they, uh, taxes, okay, for the government. They come through and they take all the rice. And if they had any male that was 14 years of age and older, he was automatically taken, or drafted, if you want to call it that, in the military. Huh. That's the reason why uh, a lot of times there was nothing but women doing the work around the villages. What, yeah. do, you, what do you think you, you took out of the culture? Um, you know, I mean, it, Vietnam changed so much of what what we eat, what we yes. do, what we listen to. What did you, uh, what parts of the culture did you take with you? Home? Yeah. I don't eat rice. Oh, you don't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I had enough of that over there. <laughs> no. Uh, I took an understanding home of just how much our country means to me, personally. And uh, when I got home, uh, my dad was very proud of me because he was a World War II veteran. And he, the small town that we lived in, he threw a big party for me to come home. And all my classmates stayed away. Not one out of 110 graduated with me. Not one showed up at that party. Huh. Yeah, it was, uh, that's the reason why I didn't stick around my hometown very long. Mm -hmm. I don't like being called a baby killer. Yeah. No, I can imagine that. Yes, and me and Big Jane Fonda, if I could have got a hold of her, I was two and a half steps away when the MPs caught me. I lost two stripes. She hit me in the face with a rotten tomato. Jane Fonda did? Yeah, or her group. There yeah. was a bunch of them right there. That's before they put up the fences between the soldiers, incoming soldiers, and the protesters. And Where was I, that at? Uh, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went against direct orders and I broke and ran. Almost got her. I was just close enough I could have got a hold of her ponytail out and jerked her head and blown off her shoulders. I hated that. But that's me. No, I understand. Not everybody felt that way, but 
I don't like that. I went over there and served my country and to be treated like that when I got home. I guess that was the reason why I understood a lot of those veterans that went up in the forests and stuff and became hermits and couldn't deal with society. It's because back then they did they don't uh, they didn't uh, put you through the training when you got home for reestablishing yourself into society. Because when you're looking over your shoulder all the time, not knowing where the next round's coming from, or group of people coming at you, uh, you get into some place like, uh, well, I came in at Edwards Air Force Base in California. No, Travis Air Force Base in California. And uh, so when they released us, well, that's right there in the San Francisco area. My golly, that's scary. I mean, I had to fly home. I didn't even like the airport. And when I got home, I was really, really jumpy. I still am. They still consider me a fairly dangerous man. Hmm. I'm still under psychiatric care. I still take my medicines. Is that the PTSD? Oh yeah, that's what it's for. What does it do to you? I'm glad you got a Jeep behind me. Because if you didn't, I probably wouldn't sit in this chair. Because I know what's behind me. Mm -hmm. uh, my poor wife. <laughs> Her dad was a Korean War, war veteran. He had PTSD. Back then they called it shell shock. Yeah. And uh, he was also a policeman, like I was for a while. And uh, <laughs> she's dealt with PTSD <laughs> all her life. <laughs> that poor lady. I don't know. But I've been married to her for 28 years. Well, I guess she she knows how to deal with it then. Well, I only knew her 18 days before I married her. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's yeah. quite a whirlwind. Oh, I knew exactly what I wanted. <laughs> she was it. <laughs> okay. I, I want to go back to, to when you were in Vietnam um, in the, I mean, just Talk a little bit about the conditions there. Oh, horrible. Uh, you didn't drink any water that was there. You made sure that the water that was drinkable was, is usually the Navy had uh, their personnel purify the water and stuff and they bring it, bring it out in great big blivets or a if you know what a blivet is. It's a great big, huge balloon full of water. Hmm. And it's a real thick plastic. And the top of it has the valves. And as you take the water out, it just, like a balloon, it'll shrink down. That way they can pick it back up, put it in the back of a truck or a helicopter somewhere and take it back out again and reuse it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the water was not good to drink. Uh, got sprayed twice with Agent Orange, and that wasn't good. Uh, I don't know. The, uh, Do you have any idea what the Agent Orange was at the time? No. All I knew is the first time we got sprayed, the C-130 come over, and the wind changed, and it drifted over on us. Well, they made a big deal. They come out with a couple of deuce and a half, and some people running around in little white suits and gloves, and put us through a, they put a rod up between the two trucks, and they put us through some chemical spray, and took all our clothes, and took our guns, all that kind of stuff. 
and when we got up the other side, we had new clothes, new guns, new boots, everything. The second time, we never even seen them. But it really didn't do any good, because they spray it. And then the next day, of course, all the leaves and everything's off the tree. You walk right through it. That's where they want you to go. Well, I was stupid. <laughs> Didn't do any good. Anybody, anybody that was even spent, I'm going to say six months in Vietnam was exposed to it anywhere, because it got into the groundwater, and it just, it was there. So what'd you think when they came out with all these white suits and and putting you through yeah, showers? We were wondering what the heck it was. They wouldn't tell us. And I didn't know what it was until I got home. And I thought, wow, gee, that thanks. Has to, yeah, has to be scary. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you, uh, when you become a GI, that's government issue. Once you're in there, they can do whatever they want to until you're out. That's the way it is. That's the way the game's played. And. Uh, we played it. You feel betrayed? Somewhat, but I'm fairly lucky. Uh, they attributed the throat cancer to uh, my system being extremely strong, because I was a country boy to begin with, with no city slicker, and uh, had a tough uh, immune system then and they give you all those shots before you go over there. So my system has been able to keep it at bay for nearly 40 years. How old are you now? 68. How old were you when you went in? 18. No, yeah, 18 and six months. Mm. I come back when I was 19. You'd already <laughs> seen a whole lot for a 19-year-old. Well, my dad told me, he said, uh, you ain't the same person. My mama was afraid of me. Oh, yeah. Daddy <laughs> used to have a trick when we were kids. When we wouldn't get out of bed, I always slept with my foot outside the cover, at least one. And he'd come by and run his thumb up that foot. Well, you know, you jump. Yeah, I like to kill him the first time he did that, and I'm serious. Uh, from a dead sleep, I had him next to the wall and had his Adam's apple right there in my hands. I could have killed him any second. My mother hollered at me and it woke me up. I was sound asleep when I did it. It's just a reaction. And uh, <laughs> two days later, she picked a wall of a loser of a fight and I never went home since. She was afraid of me. She'd get, it and get away from me. And the only way to do it is to pick a fight with me and make me leave. Hmm. Never went back. And I can understand why. I mean, now I look back at it, I'd be afraid of somebody to do that too. I didn't know just how bad I had PTSD until we went to the first uh, meeting over here at uh, Crete Medical Center here in Amarillo. And uh, they put me through some tests and they said, yeah, you have it, we just don't know how bad. Well, they put me with a counselor, my wife. I'm, if anything happens to me, my wife knows. I don't keep any secrets. She don't ask about Vietnam. I don't talk about Vietnam. Uh, we got in there. I didn't realize it, but Saturday morning used to be a ritual with me and my kids when they were little pillow fights. That was the thing. Sneak in on Daddy, jump on the bed, and hit him with a pillow. And there it would be. It would be on. Where Carolyn had to come in and wake me up before the kids did. Because the kids were afraid of Daddy when he was sleeping. I didn't know that, and she finally confessed it. And 
I remember once she woke me up. I had a bad one, bad night, and I had her in a death grip. But you know, but that's what you had to do so much. Well, out I, in dealt, the jungle, right? I dealt. I dealt with it myself for years, and it's. How do you say it? It's part of my life. I have to deal with it. Uh, nobody knows what I went through but me. And there's a few things that they, quote unquote, gave me medals for and this, that, and a few other things, but, but it's still my memories. It's not anybody else's. And when somebody says, well, I think I can understand where you've been. Oh, really? Have you been in that situation? Well, no. I, then you don't know. It's like you asking these questions because you would like to know. Right. But I can't really explain it to you. It's just like these incoming veterans from the Middle East, you know. I, I feel sorry for those guys. But at the same time, they're getting better treatment than what I get. So I honor them, I respect them. Uh, in a way, they had it as bad as I did as far as nerves, because they didn't know if they were going to hit one of those improvised explosive devices. Uh, they didn't know or still don't know when they're going to get sniper fire yeah. or mortar fire or something like that, RPGs, all that kind of stuff. Y you don't know. And it, it really, your, your nerves are so on edge and the adrenaline in your system is going all the time. And scared? Yeah. Anybody says they're not scared, they're crazy. You don't want to even be around them. No, I ain't afraid of this. Well, wait till you get into some for the first time. Yeah, I've had great big, huge men freeze on me, and I've seen the littlest guy get out there and do the most heroic things I've ever seen in my life. And it's just the person's makeup. You never really know until it happens. Then it changes you. When were you most afraid? From the time I put that foot down there for 366 days, 14 hours, and 27 minutes. That's when I landed at Travis Air Force Base. I was scared the whole time. I'll admit it. It just drives you nuts. But it was a chaplain that talked to us when we first came over there, and they said, your body is going to age 20 years for where you're going and what you're going to do. And your mind indefinitely, how far ahead, they couldn't tell. Because it plays on you. Did you ever think you weren't coming home? Oh, I wasn't expecting to come home. I really didn't. I went over there, uh, I had my brother and my cousin over there. And back there at the time, you could only have one member of the family because of what happened in World War II. <coughs> well, I made a movie about it, what, Saving Private Ryan, I think it was? Yeah. So they changed their policy. So I signed the slip like you got here, and they had to pull them out. But my cousin and my brother were both married. I was single, just out of high school. Shaved tail, no nothing, green behind the gills. Dad said I come back a different person. He said, uh, I don't know if you're really a person anymore. I said, well, how? I said, Dad, I, I, I'm me. And he said, no, you're not. He said, the son I went over there was joking and happy-go-lucky and life of the party, and he said, 
You don't even smile anymore. Got nothing to smile about. It's the way it was for years. You finally found a way to smile. How did you do that? <laughs> well, I've been married three times. The first two was my decision. The last one was the good Lord's decision. And uh, becoming a good, well, I'm going to say good, becoming a Christian man uh, changed me from what I was. If I hadn't have been, I wouldn't even be sitting in this chair talking to you. He changed me inside, where I could accept things. It's not exactly being forgiven for some of the things that you did, it's forgiving yourself for what you did. And I'm not proud of what I did. But in order to survive, it was either me or them. That's the way it is. <coughs> so you get back home and there are protesters and and uh, what did you know that there were protesters when you were in Vietnam? Well actually actually they didn't tell us what was going on in the states very much. And so it was kind of surprised like what is this? Hmm. Uh, why? What did we do? You know, it made me feel like I was I did something evil. And I was shocked myself. I was in total shock. Of course, being a country boy, there was a lot of things when I went in the military I had never seen. Right. But I didn't know that there was that much uh, racism. We didn't know what that was. Shoot, it didn't make any difference to us and my family what color of a man's skin was. How did you see it? He's a man. Yeah, but I mean, th there was so much. So how were you seeing the, the racism? I was uh, hurt inside. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that I was fighting over there so they could protest here and fight here. And it made me fight. What did I do that for? Why? Did you know, what did you know about the Vietnam War and the reasons uh, for it when you went? Well, uh, to start with, uh, I know now it was a political war. But you didn't know that then? Uh, we knew something was up when they told us we couldn't do certain things. As in? Well. Uh, we were not supposed to cross the DMZ. And we weren't supposed to go into Laos. We weren't supposed to uh, um, desecrate any bodies or anything. We had certain things that we couldn't do, certain, th certain things we could do. Uh, when it comes to banana plantations, off limits because that was an export and that's what their economy was based on. But that's also where the enemy was hiding. What do you do? Uh, pagodas, churches, uh, religious, uh, you couldn't fire upon those. Uh, but they can fire out of those at you. So. It was politics, a lot of it. So you were supposed to fight with your one hand tied behind your back? Basically. Most of the time. Most of the time. And, and a lot of it was happened also in the Middle East. A lot of it happened mm -hmm. the same way. You know, they got their customs. They have to obey their customs while they're in their country. And uh, it's politics. 
That's all it is. I mean, uh, truthfully speaking, if we had had a general and a president that would turn the general loose like they had in War Schwarzkopf and Desert Storm, it had been over in four months. It's no bigger than California, the whole country. Now, we could have taken that in four months. Easy. Just line up and just go north until you hit China and then stop. They weren't going to do it that way. Oh, no. No. Uh, people make money off of war. Okay? I. I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but Lyndon Baines Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson made a lot of money because he used to own Brown and Root, the construction company. When he became president, it went to his wife. Every Air Force base along the coast, east coast of it, that was critical for supplies and everything, Brown and Root built. You can put two, to get two and two together there, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> so they made a lot of money. Firearms, ammunition, bomb making. Right out here in, in, in Pampa, uh, Cabot. Mm -hmm. They used to make the gun barrels for the tanks. I had a good friend of mine that made them hmm. till he died. I mean, he, older man, but he sat there and told me what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So people made money off of it. Yeah. There's people making money off the Middle East right now in the war. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people say you got to have a good war once in a while just to keep the, honor, the economy going. Come on. Give me a break. There's got to be something else. Anybody that's ever been in any kind of war hopes the other guy never has to go through it. Ever. These gentlemen here, never been in combat. I'm glad. I really am. Because it's, it's not pretty. I'm glad there's a lot of people. These people that went to Canada, and then got pardoned later. I run into a couple of them in my lifetime. I'm glad you went to Canada. You'd have been just somebody else over there that died. Just another statistic. Just another number. That's all that mattered. Did you come to understand ultimately what some of the peace protesters were about? The ones. Well, some of them. I can understand that. Yeah. Uh, uh, peace protesting can be a good thing. It keeps the uh, conscience of uh, the country where it should be. You know, if you got to fight, get in there like Schwarzkopf did, kick rear, take names, and be done with it. And when it's over, it's over. That was supposed to have been a four or five month ordeal. They had actually planned for at least four months worth of fighting. In a hundred hours it was done. Yeah. Because the man was sharp. He didn't let the media know what was going on. He didn't tell anybody anything. Only his senior officers. And you will be ready to do this, this, and this. And when I say go, go. Don't stop, go. Is over just that fast. That's the way it should. That's the way a war should be fought. Just go in there, and be done with it. Of course, nobody made any money in that short war. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, well, I appreciate your time and and talking about this. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, I've run into some of my but good veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, like this neighbor down here I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I met a man over there when I was going through my uh -huh. uh, treatments. 
and uh, my outfit was close to the TMZ. His was Force Recon right there in the middle, and that's uh, my neighbor was down there. So it's 101st Force Recon, 101st. And uh, if you know anything about the history of uh, Vietnam in 1969, June 6th, Hill 944. Hamburger Hill. Yeah. My squad, a man named Rick Biggs and myself, were the first ones to start up the hill. And his force recon started up the other side of the hill. We were to meet at the top. Uh, ten days later, it was over. And when we went in there, we couldn't see any further than I can see these cameras. It was really thick jungle. When we walked off, it was bald, except for a few pieces of timber here and there. And then they say that you can't see a bullet you know, when it's through the air. You get an awesome shot at you, and you're laying down and you're looking up, you can see them. <laughs> Yeah. The light, the sky's a blur. Hmm. Yeah, we lost a lot of people on that hill. What ha what happened to your person My, that was going up the other side? Uh, Did he make? He it started too? out with there. There was thirty four in his little group. There was uh, an entire two companies on my side. Now that's four platoons. Reinforced is fifteen men. So there was 60 in each platoon. Uh, nine of us walked off. And you were one of them? Well, I was limping off. <laughs> I had front metal in my rear gear. Oh. <laughs> well, that's my not daddy told me, he said, keep your head down and keep your rear in the air because your rear end hurt, will heal and your head won't. <laughs> But I get hit in the head too. So, oh. yeah, I had a sniper bullet hit right here, and it went through the seal pot into the fiberglass liner, ricocheted off my hard head, and came back out again, and laid about four inches of skull open. And they just sewed it up and gave me a new pot and said, "The hill's still there. Go get it." <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Well, ten days. Yeah. You must have wondered whether you were going to come out of that. I didn't expect to. Yeah. That was my uh, that was my nail in the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> also found out too that there, there's a bullet with your name on it. And my first sergeant found out that he I had taken my shirt off the outer shirt jacket, and I had laid it on the bush, and I was down there in the foxhole getting a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper, and to put it mildly, all hell broke loose. And when it was over with, I put my shirt back on, was walking down there, and the first sergeant grabbed me and set me down. He says, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, yeah, why? He said, look at your shirt. There was bullet holes, just like that, across there. And I had my military ID in my pocket, and my face was gone. <laughs> right in the center of that thing. He said, that's the bullet with your name on it. You're going to make it out this hill. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I did. And you did. Yep. Well, he you. didn't, but I did. Well, thank yeah. you for your service. Well, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I uh, can't say it was a pleasure, but I was happy to do it. And if I was called up today, I'd do it again. Thanks, sir. You're welcome.